All right, it is noon in Shreveport, Louisiana, where Dr. Wilden is located. My name is Jackie. Thank you very much for everyone for joining us for our inaugural ClearPoint TV peer-to-peer -peer webinar series. Um, this is gonna be the first of many. As you can imagine, we're doing a lot of distance uh, education and we're very thankful for Dr. Wilden to join us today. Dr. Wilden is a neurosurgeon at Willis Knighton uh, Health System. She is also the founder of Tri-State Neurosurgery and a longtime ClearPoint user. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Wilden. We do have Q&A in, uh, in the chat function, so you can submit your questions and we will be reviewing them at the end of Dr. Wilden's procedures. So Dr. Wilden, uh, at the end of her presentation, I'll let her take it away. Okay, well, hello. Thank you uh, for inviting me to discuss our team's method of using ClearPoint for maximum efficiency in MRI-guided cases. Our focus today will be on deep brain stimulation lead placement, but this general method can also be used for laser ablation uh, and stereotactic biopsy as well. Um, I am a consultant for ClearPoint, but I'm paid only for travel, not for teaching. So the traditional way of performing stereotactic surgery often involves complex equipment, excess staff, and some degree of discomfort for the patient who is maintained awake in a head frame locked to the bed. And this situation is simply not feasible for many community-based hospitals and the patients that they serve. MRI-based surgery using the ClearPoint platform has been an excellent fit for our community healthcare system because it is surgeon-driven and it does not require other specialists or equipment, which we did not have. Uh, it has also been exceptionally accurate, safe, and comfortable for our patients. Over the last seven years, we have fine-tuned the procedure such that our average DBS time from pinning to removal from the MRI is just under four hours. And this time frame allows us to routinely do two DBS cases in a day, and that minimizes the MRI days that we need to request to accomplish our patient volume. By improving the patient experience, we have also been able to expand into previously undertreated sectors. Uh, that you know, may have been averse to awake brain surgery, and that includes the very elderly, uh, patients with marginal education, and women. Uh, and this has globally increased our volume. In addition, ClearPoint procedures do not require a highly specialized awake surgery anesthesia team, and that is helpful in the community setting where anesthesia may vary day to day. And finally, image-driven DBS can be performed by the surgeon alone, and this is helpful if there are not neurology or physiologist uh, specialists at your disposal. We have gradually shortened the basic procedure by fine-tuning a variety of steps, which I will review today. Major changes we have made to increase efficiency over the years include pre-planning, adjusting the frame to target prior to our burr hole, using a dural knife to minimally open the dura for stylet placement, and securing the lead with a cement microplate combination in lieu of a traditional stim lock. So let's go ahead and review the procedure. And at the end of the PowerPoint, we will run through a video that hopefully will put it all together for everyone. So the patient is brought down to the MRI suite and they're gonna be intubated in our MRI ante room. Uh, the MRI table is prepared with regular padding for surgery. We place the MRI compatible head frame at the top of the bed, as close to the edge as you can for your operative comfort. The scrub technician will prepare the surgical table in the MRI room and will do a safety check with our circulator. And this ensures that no MRI incompatible equipment is on the sterile field before it is rolled uh, to the back of the MRI room. The innovated patient is then carefully moved onto the MRI table and pinned into the frame using four point fixation. For epilepsy or posterior fossa cases, the patient will be positioned prone on chest rolls. For DBS cases, like on the right here, the patient will be positioned supine, as seen uh, in this second picture. And this represents our newer Siemens setup. The left side represents our older Philips setup. So we have done cases on two different MRIs uh, and had the platform work equally uh, on both. Once the patient is pinned, the patient is moved into the MRI room and into the MRI bore. Anesthesia will have limited access to the patient during the case, so we typically place our blood pressure cuff on the leg, and we place an arterial line if the patient has a cardiac history or is very elderly over about 75 to 80. Anesthesia is then located at the foot of the bed with an MRI-compatible anesthesia monitor and machine. The sterile field is located at the back of the MRI bore as seen on the right. 
Our pedals for bipolar and drill, as well as our suction, go off to the right of the MRI, and the bipolar cable goes through a waveguide to the back room where it connects to the machine. And you can see that metallic back here. We create a sterile field around the patient's head using a retractable drape that is provided by ClearPoint. We will look at video of the drape placement at the end of the presentation. Um, in brief though, the drape is connected to both the front and the back of the MRI machine, which allows the patient to move in and out of the machine without losing sterility. For DBS, a grid with fiducials on top is placed surrounding the coronal suture on one or both sides for unilateral and bilateral cases, respectively. And then the patient is returned to the ISO center or midpoint of the MRI. And they are scanned, and at the software station, the surgeon can define the ACPC in a midline point. An initial target is then chosen. Now, you can choose an initial target based on indirect coordinates, or like I recommended at the beginning, I actually pre-plan my target and my entry off a three Tesla MRI that we do the week prior to surgery. We can then import those coordinates into ClearPoint at the beginning of the case to save time. And I think that is definitely a nice way to cut off some planning time from the day of surgery um, and allows you to plan in a more relaxed setting um, if you're able to get a, a pre-screening or pre-planning MRI. Uh, we have been ordering pre-planning MRIs the week prior with and without contrast uh, to screen for any late stage disease that might interrupt DBS. That's the way we phrase it for insurance and we have never had anyone turn us down. So it definitely is feasible to get a pre-planning MRI a few days before the case. A trajectory is then also defined um, basically that avoids your arteries, veins, sulci, and ventricles. Again, it does save time if a trajectory has already been pre-planned and can simply be imported. And once the software and the computer understands your target and your trajectory, it's going to calculate the entry point on the marking grid with a number and a letter. And the two entries that are shown represent coordinates for two different types of stereotactic frames that ClearPoint offers. Uh, the right entry is for the skull mount and the scalp mount is for the scalp mount. Um, because the scalp mount sits up a little bit higher than the skull mount from the bone, the entry will be calculated slightly differently. I personally prefer the scalp mount because this minimizes our incision and I will show you that in a little bit. So the top fiducial layer is then peeled off the grid and a marking tool that has a sharp end is used to puncture through the grid base and scalp and make a divot in the bone at your proposed entry. The entry divot should be clearly visible. Um, so you wanna make sure that you get your marking tool kind of lodged in the bone. Um, it should basically be able to be freestanding before you remove it. Then you're gonna make a small two to three centimeter incision through the marked location, as you can see on the right. And then you're gonna place self-retaining retractors on both above and below the incision to help enhance our exposure through a small incision. Uh, our retractors are completely plastic and they attach to a curlex above and a rubber band that runs across the frame below, which you can see here. And at that point, you can see right here that your entry divot, which I mark with a skin marker after I take uh, the bony marking tool out, uh, should be clearly visible because this is gonna be your landmark that you're gonna try and mount the frame over. So this is the stereotactic disposable frame that ClearPoint provides. It has three fiducials in the frame base and a center cannula that contains gadolinium and acts as a fourth fiducial. The plastic stereo frame, stereotactic frame base is then secured to the skull through six point uh, fixate, screw fixation. This is an epilepsy case here, not a DBS case. That's why I'm on the back of the head for those of you maybe thinking I'm doing DBS for stroke, uh, I'm not. Um, the screws typically on the scalp mount pop through the scalp and seat into the bone. Uh, of note, your frame needs to be directly over your divot from the entry tool. Um, you really don't have a lot of leeway here. You need to be within two or three millimeters of your proposed entry. And if your frame is off by more than that, then the entry may need to be redefined or the frame may need to be remounted. And those are both time-wasting um, 
issues, obviously. So like my father said, there's never time to do it right, but there's always time to do it over. So if you're mounting the frame over that entry mark or letting a resident do it, just make sure it is directly over your mark. Um, and then once you have the frame base, you're gonna put the plastic top, it just snaps on with two screws. And you're basically going to use the orange and the blue knobs that are labeled pitch and roll to adjust your center cannula so that it's pointing directly at your entry. So once your frame is mounted and you've aimed your center cannula using your orange and blue knobs, the patient's gonna be returned to ISO center for a scan. Hand controllers can be attached to the frames to allow an assistant to adjust the frame toward the target without having to lean in and potentially compromise your sterility, which is obviously important, particularly with implanted hardware. And at this point, a number of target specific scans can be performed depending on your preference and your particular machine and the brain target and the entry can be fine tuned as needed. Once the final target has been defined, the software is going to calculate what adjustments are needed on those pitch and roll knobs so that the center cannula is pointing at your chosen target. And the hand controller is used to make these adjustments and the software calculates the final error, which ideally should be less than 0.5, 0.6 millimeters. So then the patient is moved back to the sterile field for burr hole creation. So I like to mark the position of the smart frame top relative to the base with a skin marker or steri strip. Uh, that's just so the frame can be reassembled after drilling in roughly the same position. I use a ceramic stylet with ink on its tip to mark our final and new entry point prior to removing the frame top. And I'd say in most cases it is more than about two millimeters different from your original divot mark. Um, and this can be slightly different, basically, because you might have changed the target or the entry slightly. So then I remove the frame top from the base and I drill a six millimeter burr hole centered on the final entry point. Uh, I do not disrupt the dura if possible because, again, CSF loss and bleeding are going to lose time in the case. And I then replace the frame top in line with the previously marked position and the patient is returned to the ISO center of the MRI. And then some orthogonal imaging is performed here and any adjustments are made as needed if you've shifted the frame a little bit. Uh, usually nine to one or two adjustments are needed at this point and an acceptable error again is less than or equal to 0 0.6 millimeters. Once our center cannula is pointing reliably at target, uh, I use a dural knife to puncture the dura. And then I put the ceramic stylet with a peel away sheath down the center cannula to our target. The needed length of the stylet from the top of the frame to the target will be calculated by the software and measured by the surgeon uh, prior to inserting the stylet into the peel away. And then once both our stylets are at target for a bilateral DBS, the patient will go back to ISO center and we'll do a T1 volumetric scan to assess our accuracy. If we're satisfied with our accuracy and the stylets look good in our target, uh, we will remove our ceramic stylets and insert the DBS lead down the PLOA. And then we'll finish off the case by securing our leads and uh, tunneling in usual fashion. And we'll show that in the video in just a few minutes. Uh, MRI can be performed uh, immediately after lead insertion and or after closure to confirm final placement of the DBS leads prior to the patient leaving the MRI and being awakened. Uh, that is one of the benefits I think of using a 1.5T right now is that I always have a scan that confirms my leads before the patient is awake uh, and out of the MRI, which, which is nice perk. Um, Next, you can kind of see how our method has evolved over the years. The first image represents our initial use of a bicoronal incision with the skull mount uh, and the stem lock. The second image represents our use of a medium incision with the scalp mount and again, the stem lock. And the final image represents our current incision coupled with the scalp mount without stem lock use. And I've been doing this technique for probably about two years now. For lit procedures, the ceramic stylet and the peel away sheath would be removed and the laser catheter would be inserted to target instead of the DBS lead. The laser itself would then be appropriately measured and inserted down through the catheter. The saline lines and the distal laser fiber in our setup are run through the drape, down through the bore and out the door of the MRI room where they would be connected to our visualized workstation. 
We would then use our workstation in communication with uh, real-time MRI to ablate our target with the real-time visual feedback. The powers and times used are highly dependent on the disease and target. Once surgery is over, we simply remove the laser catheter uh, along with the smart frame like we would in DBS, and we fill the small burr hole again with some biocement and the wound is closed with the suture. Uh, we have successfully used the ClearPoint platform in combination with the visualized laser to perform mesial temporal ablation, pallidotomy, thalamotomy, and tumor ablation. And it's a nice tool with a lot. Uh, in combination with ClearPoint, I find that we're able to treat a very wide range of pathologies with a very similar technique, which is helpful, you know, if you're somewhat limited in terms of support staff and, and the understanding of the procedure. So these are our institutional numbers for those interested. Um, obviously, the safety profile of ClearPoint is well within acceptable limits for DBS. Um, our average lead error is 0.6 millimeters. I've had one deep hemorrhage with neurological outcome, and I've had three cranial site infections with necessitating further surgery. I will say that all of those complications were in the first half of my ClearPoint experience. So I do definitely think that it is less common to get infection once your team is a little more experienced. And I think that's probably true of, of pretty much anything. Okay, I'm just gonna come off screen sharing for a second so I can load up my video and then we'll go through that and then we can start our question and answer. Again, just as a reminder, as Dr. Wilden's pulling up her video of her case, um, please submit questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen where you see the two little bubbles, and we will address those after her video. Okay, uh, is my video showing up on your end, Jackie? Showing uh, your presentation. Uh, okay. So stop share, okay, and then I'm gonna share this. Okay, how about now? Video? Okay. Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll just stop here and maybe point out a few things that are time saving for us, um, but largely this will follow the PowerPoint. And this is a bilateral DBS case. So we're going to start out by doing a prep and draping out our operative area with blue towels. We're going to attach our curlex for the self-retaining retractors. And now we're going to go ahead and attach our clear point drape. And this always scares people more than it should. Uh, you just put the middle sticky piece on the operative field, and then you're gonna grab a series of black and white tabs that are attached to the drape. The black tabs are handed off to an assistant on the side who then pulls the black tabs through to the other side of the MRI and attaches it to hooks, just like on this side. So the tabs are colored for simplicity. So the black tabs go to the far end, and your white tabs attached to the near end of the MRI. And that um, elasticity basically is what allows the drape to move in real time with the MRI. We find this works best if you have two assistants, one on each side, so someone's not having to run back and forth. Once all your tabs are connected, black on the far end, white on the near end, you're gonna shake out your drape and you can see it expands quite nicely to create a large operative field. And now I usually remove the plastic from my operative area so I don't get caught up on the scalp mount, if you're using the scalp mount. And you're gonna place your grids roughly centered over the coronal suture on both sides. Now you're gonna do that T1 volume to define your entry on the grid. And you're gonna peel off that fiducial top. Don't try and puncture through it, won't work well. Uh, and you're gonna use the marking tool to pop straight through at the scalp and into the bone until it seats and is freestanding. Now you're gonna remove that and peel off the grid. 
you're going to see our two holes and I'm going to make a two to three centimeter incision with a regular scalpel through both of them. Now for DBS, you are going to want to undermine a pocket and I'll show you at the end why this is a time saver, but just go ahead and undermine when you have no hardware in the incision. Make a nice big pocket so you can coil up all that excess lead at the end without having to fiddle around when the lead's already in place. And now to maximize our exposure, we're going to put some self-retaining retractors in. So these are just plastic hooks. Again, they attach to a rubber band down at the bottom of the frame, and they attach to a Curlex up top. And it may not seem like a lot of enhanced exposure, but it's worth it, trust me. And now you're going to see your divot that you're going to mount your frame over. You can see that little hole right there that I've marked. And again, as a time saver, mount your frame correctly. Mount it right over the black mark or the divot or however you want to mark it, but you really got no leeway there if you want to save time. Now you're going to put your frame top on the base once the bases are secure. And you're going to use the orange and the blue knobs to basically point toward your anticipated entry. That just minimizes the amount of fiddling we have to do with the hand controller later on, if you're relatively close to target. Go ahead and put your hand controllers on, especially if you're using an assistant who's not a doctor. You don't want them leaning in or compromising sterility. It's best if they just adjust the frame from the end of the bore using the hand controller. Now you're going to do your um, target specific scans. You're going to pick a final target and entry and you're going to adjust your controls so that your center cannula is pointing at your final target. You can see me there using a steri strip to uh, basically mark my position of the top and the bottom of the frame. Now I'm going to use a stylet with marker on the end to mark my new entry. And now I'm going to take the frame top off and I'm going to drill a small six millimeter burr hole right along uh, the new entry. And again, we're going to try and avoid here popping through the dura. And once you're done with your burr hole, which should be fairly minimal, um, you're going to remount the frame and realign it with the stereo strip so it's roughly pointing where you were before. And you're just going to check with your stylet in a minute here to make sure that you have good clearance. You don't want to have any kind of bony collision, especially with DBS because it can shift it slightly. But if you were detailed in doing your burr hole originally, you should largely be in the center of that and not have major collision issues. But again, it's all about the details here. Uh, now you're going to go back in and just adjust and do any adjustments needed. So the center cannula is repointing at your desired target. And now you're going to go ahead and use this dural knife to go down and just puncture the dura right where you want to place the stylet. There's no reason to open it widely here. Um, again, that can just cause excess bleeding, et cetera, lose time. And now you're going to put your stylet in place. And the ceramic stylet is surrounded by a peel away, which will serve as the strut for your DBS lead in a second. And when the stylet's all the way down, it's going to kind of click into place if you're not familiar with the clear point system. I usually do a little to seal right around the base of the burr hole just to stabilize everything at this point. And now you're going to do a volumetric T1 and assess the accuracy of the ceramic stylet at your target. And if you're satisfied with that, you're going to go ahead and place the DBS lead when you come back to the, the back of the bore. So you can see me sliding a DBS lead in there through the peel away sheath. Um, and you'll see me on the other side start to take out the other ceramic stylet. Of note, you do not remove the entire construct. You only want to remove the center stylet. And once your leads are in place, now we're going to secure them with our first point of fixation. So I pull the center cannula up and I retract the peel away just so I can see the lead as it's coming out of the burr hole. And now I'm going to use a bio cement that I've loaded into a syringe to fill the burr hole around the lead so that the lead is 
fixated into place. Because your narrow working angle, it will be advantageous to use a syringe for cement uh, application here. And I basically just fill the burr hole around the lead and use a cottonoid to tamp it down so the cement is largely even with the skull. You don't want it to volcano up around the lead because that could potentially lead to skin erosion. Then you're gonna do another scan while the bio cement cures and holds the lead into place. That usually takes about four or five minutes. I usually do a T1, maybe a T2, you know, just to see where the lead is at in terms of depth. And uh, at this point, if the cement has cured and the leads are in place, you're gonna go ahead and unlock the lead from its holder and take out the stylet and basically uncouple the lead from the frame. And now we're gonna pull the lead down and we're gonna remove the frame top. And once your frame top is off, I do a second point of fixation. I basically just use my finger to gently pull the lead to the side and I put a titanium microplate uh, about a centimeter from the exit point. This is in line with the prior description of this technique by Dr. Nemot uh, some years ago, I believe in the early 2000s, which discussed cement and a microplate as an alternative to the stim lock. And we found that this has worked very well, better actually than the stim lock. So once your leads have two points of fixation on each side, you can go ahead and remove your smart frames and you just unscrew uh, the screws. And then pull the frame off. Um, now you're going to go ahead and tunnel a pocket toward the side of your battery for your distal lead tips, which you'll put your protectors on. You can see I have them tied together there, uh, labeled left and right. And we're just gonna go ahead and tunnel those down for stage two at some point in the future. And now you're gonna see why I undermined at the beginning. You have quite a bit of lead that you want to get to lay flat and nice in a spiral around the burr hole. It's just so much easier to undermine at the beginning than wait to do it now where you got your hardware in place and all this and that, especially if you're teaching institution and the residents are doing it. Um, just undermine at the beginning and then that gives you plenty of space to coil the lead and have it sit nice and flat in a spiral around the burr hole. And at that point, we close, usually two Vicryl per incision. And we pop the patient's head out of the frame and wake them up or go to stage two if we're doing a same day surgery. And like I said, from basically our grid puncture to our, um, our grid puncture to our closure right now for bilateral DBS is really running about two hours and 45 minutes. Um, obviously the scan time adds on to the total case time, which is why our complete time is about three hours and 55 minutes. And for a unilateral, it's really not much different. I mean, that is one of the benefits of ClearPoint is that you can basically do bilateral simultaneous DBS, particularly if you have a senior resident who knows what they're doing. Uh, you can both work simultaneously. Uh, but our unilaterals are probably about two hours uh, from grid puncture to closure. So that's that. I'd love to open it up for questions because I do get a lot of random questions from people um, over the last year about how we do things. So now's your chance in lifetime to ask and discuss it. So please shoot me a question. Thank you, Dr. Wilden. That was, that was great. There are actually two options for questions. You can either put them into the chat or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. There are a few questions here on the chat. Um, so you mentioned at the top of your presentation, Dr. Wilden, doing two cases a day. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your journey? I, I don't know if you started with two cases a day seven years ago and maybe how that evolved <laughs> together. 
Yeah, with, maybe with I should pull up that. Maybe I should pull up that slide that kind of like shows how our incision has evolved over time. Um, so I have to actually give credit to Joe Burnett, the CEO of ClearPoint. Um, he actually came to me some years ago when he first started. I guess it was probably three to four now. And Joe said, you know, um, I think for widespread use of ClearPoint, I need the case to be shorter. Could you? think about options to make it shorter and, and come up with some ideas. And I remember sitting there over like a coffee and being like, okay, how short do you want it? And he was like, two hours. And I was like, okay, uh, at that time it was taking us about five and a half to six. And I'm like, all right, that's, that's a little bit of a big ask, but we can, we can definitely work on that. So that, that is the origin of like why we actively kind of tried to start coming up with ways to shorten the procedure. Um, so I think some of the big um, advances that we made was fashioning our DVS flow more similar to a laser flow. Um, and that you know, before people always were saying, well, do your bore hole at the beginning for DVS and make it large, open the arachnoid all the way. And I guess, you know, as I was doing more laser, I couldn't help but think, why, why do we do that? You know, why not just aim to where we're going and then use a pneumatic drill to just go right down that pathway? I mean, sometimes I have to drill a little bit more anterior or lateral, but not enough to justify making the burr hole earlier. So I think that was definitely a big change that we didn't make until about two, three years ago when we started doing more laser. Um, so we definitely, when we first started, I mean, if you're first starting ClearPoint and you're using like more of a bicoronal and a skull mount, our cases would take like six to eight hours when I first started in 2013. Um, and I've tried over time, and I've kind of judged this based on my residents. I've definitely tried over time to make it more accessible right away to a new user. Um, I don't think there's anything that we're doing now that we can't teach um, someone brand new who's essentially a fully trained surgeon to do within a few cases. Uh, so I do think the overall learning curve is lower now with how we're doing it. Um, my senior residents and fellows are able to pick it up really within about two to three cases uh, to the point that they're essentially independent. So I think that bodes well for telling other surgeons, you know, you should be able to pick this up relatively straightforward, which I think was definitely not the case in the older way I was doing it. Uh, there was a lot more fiddle factor. Great, thank you. And there's a second question. So in your uh your bicoronal uh, phase back seven years ago versus how you're doing more minimally invasive um, uh, entries today. Uh, can you talk a little bit about length of stay for your patients and how that's evolved? Yeah, uh, much better. <laughs> so, I mean, I just, again, you know, nothing, we were getting nothing easy in Shreveport. So everybody was on like three blood thinners. Everybody had COPD. Everybody had had a heart stent. Uh, everybody was like, you know, median age, 77. So it was just, you know, it was a tough population. The veterans, obviously the Air Force here with Barksdale is a huge source of our referrals. So from that standpoint, we just kind of found anecdotally that if we could get people out from under anesthesia on um, like less than about four and a half hours, they did spectacular. They would go home next day, minimal pain, minimal confusion. And if we ended up going over about five and a half hours, things weren't as, as good. Um, they would do fine eventually, but they might be here, you know, pain or grogginess, you know, whatever, maybe three, four days. So I think really our length of stay now is about one fourth to one third of what it was when we were doing a much longer surgery. And I don't think it has as much to do with the incision as, as it does the anesthesia time. Um, just, you know, again, I don't have any hard and fast science on that, but anecdotally for me and the older fragile people, if you can hit four and a half hours or less, uh, it's really going to be a winner in terms of how they recover. Great. Thank you. Um, another question here from the audience, um, and we do have about 64 people attending, just so you know, from uh, looks like France, uh, Sweden, and across the United States. Uh, and Toronto, where this question is from. Um, how has preoperative planning assisted you in your interoperative procedures? Do you use preoperative planning for all types of procedures, DBS, lid, tumor biopsy, ablation, or just for a certain subset? Uh, yeah, great question. Hey, if I can get an MRI approved the week before, which I almost always can, I'll pre-plan everybody. Because the nice thing about doing the case, if you've got a pre-plan, is all you got to do is do like, I'll do like a, you know, let's say I pre-plan an STN. 
And uh, I, I'll still do a T2, but all I got to do is just look at it real quick, maybe run one or two measurements, like 30 seconds, and we're done. If I'm happy, I'm like, all right, let's go. Um, whereas when I sit down in my office, and like, for instance, I have my laptop uh, over to the left with my CD for tomorrow, I'll sit down, you know, grab a coffee, look at their anatomy, see, you know, are the sides slightly asymmetric? Does their brainstem have a tilt to it? Do they have some atrophy? Uh, what's my best entry? Maybe there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. Maybe I'll play around with a couple of different entries. Like it's just a totally different experience when you're like pre-planning at your leisure. Uh, and you can really, really get it right where you want. And you can like go through maybe four or five different options and settle on the one where you're like, yeah, this target and this entry are totally gonna kill it. Uh, you know, whereas when you're trying to plan during a case, I mean, from a surgeon standpoint, right? That's a totally different dynamic. Like you at your desk versus you in the OR is a very different different surgeon, right? <laughs> As all of our coworkers will tell us. So when you're in the OR, it's like, all right, let's keep going. You know, they're 80, we need to get them out of here. Uh, and so your planning is probably gonna be a little quicker, a little less meticulous. And so I 100% pre-plan. Make it fun, enjoy it. I mean, I love stereo taxes. So, I mean, I could pre-plan every night and that could be like my hobby. So, you know, it, it's just uh, absolutely recommended. And I do it for everything if I can get an MRI. Um, if for whatever reason they're not approving an MRI, um, then I'll just plan during the case. But uh, it's also great for teaching. Like, you know, try teaching your resident about planning like complex tumor or something um, while in live time, while you're also trying to teach them about the hardware, it just, you're, they're not going to have as much time to absorb it. Whereas like tonight, my resident for tomorrow will come in and they'll just sit here in a chair in a nice quiet environment. And I'll be able to go through a lot of more teaching with them as far as pre-planning. So a hundred percent, I do it hundred percent of the time if we're able to get an MRI and I highly, highly recommend that. Okay, that's great. Um, another another question. So for sites that are starting up, um, there's always a, a conversation that takes place with radiology. And I know that uh, you had those similar conversations when you moved uh, to Willis Knight. And maybe you could talk a little bit about um, some, some tips and tricks, especially for, you know, new fellows who are negotiating their attending position as they move on. Yeah, so it depends on how well they know you. Um, I kind of had to like, amp up over time the more time I was asking for. Uh, originally they granted me two days a month to use the MRI um, and now you know after a few years when they had seen some of our results and they were very happy with what we were doing um, in the community at one of my renegotiations I asked for two days a week um, and so you know I think you can increase the time you ask for but you've got to have some collateral to back up why you're asking you know you're either showing numbers that you've been growing your practice or i mean ideally if you can treat somebody that administration knows you know dbs in particular is very visible um and i get that's largely where most of our business comes from oh i saw larry at church and he's been shaking the last 50 years and then he wasn't so i thought well i'll come see you too i mean in reality that's where we get the large majority of our referrals is from people who visually recognize our other patients and so you know if you've got a little clout you can probably ask for more time um if you have research money or money at your disposal for some reason you can offer to pay them that's always a surefire way uh to get time uh we don't pay them we just have an agreement that we offer something to the community. Um, now, that being said, they were thrilled when we went from getting one case done in a day to getting two done in a day, because if I just have two cases a week, I'll just operate one day. And uh, the other day, I'll run some clinic or do some other type of surgery, and radiology has the MRI back. So I do think that if you can start out by being able to tell them that your cases are going to be, you know, maybe just a third of their day or a half of their day, that's good, as opposed to saying, yeah, I think we're going to be in there 11 hours, you know, all your inpatients will be backed up. Um, so, you know, I would simply suggest don't ask for too much right away, uh, but realize as you build clout, you'll be able to ask for more. Um, pay them if you can, and uh, most of us can't, but if you can, great. Uh, and finally, try and make your case time as short as possible, because at the end of the day, it's a shared resource and everybody wants it. And so by minimizing your case time, um, you're going to increase your likelihood that they're going to be willing to share with you. Very good. Thank you. We have an additional question from the audience. Actually, two more. Uh, how much time does the pre-planning MRI save? Is this feasible for most institutions? 
Yeah, I would say pre-planning saves at least 30 to 60 minutes. I mean, I'll spend a good half hour to an hour planning a bilateral or a complex tumor. I'll get out my skull and like look at the bony landmarks and figure out like if we're lateral or posterior fossa, you know, where exactly do I want to put the smart frame? Uh, so I would say a, a good 30 to 60 minutes on um, pre-planning saves. And I think it should be feasible, again, especially if you're doing movement disorders and your payer is Medicare, we've never had any kickback about that. Um, so, you know, and plus I operate in a 1.5T, uh, so I like to get a pre-planning on a three Tesla. And I do some special scans on that that maybe I don't get on a 1.5T. So I definitely think that it should be feasible for most insurances. Like I said, that's not usually an issue for us. And, um, you know, most patients, I think, are more than willing to have a pre-op MRI if you tell them, oh, well, I'm going to use it to plan before we put you to sleep. So we're exactly sure where to go. Patients will be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. You know, so I haven't really, some patients will want a little Valium for their pre-scan, but it's never been a major issue or inconvenience. So I think it should be feasible for most people. Very good. We have one more question here. What are your biggest potential points of error during the case? frame mounting and shift, moving patient in and out of the MRI. What are the fail safes? Yeah, yeah, this is from John, isn't it? I saw that pop up, <laughs> uh, my partner here. <laughs> so um, major sources of error, I tried to touch on through the video, um, mounting the frame wrong over the divot uh, can be a big source of error. If you don't have room to move your entry, you're gonna have to remount your frame. Um, patient should not move, moving in and out of the MRI. Uh, again, the patient is locked in a stereotactic frame. So, you know, that being said, I did not show video of that part of it. When we put the patient in the original frame, we make sure all four points of fixation are tight and I actually move the head, move the frame. I check for any kind of movement before we even go back into the MRI. So that is a good point. I did not show that, but you just want to make sure at the base that your frame is tight, you know, basic stereotactic principle. And if it is, the head should not be moving uh, even with the movement in and out of the MRI. Um, the imaging is your fail safe. Um, like I tell my residents, you know, uh, like the ORM, I guess, for spine, you can't hide if you're making a mistake. Um, it will be glaringly obvious. So, um, you know, you have a hemorrhage, you have pneumocephalus, uh, you have a lead malposition, you're going to see it right away. And imaging is essentially your fail safe. And that's why I do like to image right up to the end of the case. Now, I don't always image the whole brain to save time. I may just image like the mid to the end of the lead, but I do think doing frequent imaging will keep you kind of uh, true to yourself and true to the procedure if you're starting to kind of get off track or have an error. Okay, that's good. Um, so we do have a number of our clinical specialists on this call as well to learn from you, Dr. Wilden, and uh, there was a question of, you know, do you like having clinical specialists support in the, your case and why? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think as a lot of you know, my clinical specialist is Shruti Gupta. Uh, who I trained with as a fellow. So, I mean, Shruti and I are family, so it's always great to have her there. Uh, and then, of course, Jessica joined us last year, and she's been great, too. Um, you know, I do think clinical specialists are helpful. Um, I especially think it's helpful for the MRI uh, team. Now, we have a great MRI team here. Uh, we have the same two guys that come uh, every time, and they've done some special training with Shruti and Jessica and with visual aids, and they understand the procedure, and they understand the scans. But, you know, like, uh, again, like I tell the residents, MRI surgery is a complex system, period. We are a super experienced team, and even with that, there will be certain error messages or certain machine things that just appear, and we're all like, huh, never seen that before. Why is that happening? And it's rare, but I mean, it's a complex physical system. You know, it's MRI, it's surgery, it's a lot of people, it's electromagnetism, you know, there's just a lot of stuff going on. And so I think from that standpoint, that's where the clinical specialists are really helpful is that when you do run into some unexpected technical issue, which may not be often, but it only has to happen once and you don't have someone there to help you to really uh, make that memorable. So I think uh, even though it's rare to have a technical issue, when you do, the clinical specialists are really invaluable. And then, you know, just from the standpoint that our clinical specialist, uh, probably because Shruti and I go way back as friends, will, will actually give me advice on, you know, maybe we should try this, maybe we should do this differently. And likewise, I asked their opinion about it, just even when we were changing certain surgical aspects of things because they've seen a lot of cases. And so I think they're just a really great resource, not only for the MRI folk, but um, to bounce some, some surgery ideas off of because they're very experienced. So our field force for ClearPoint, for anyone who's new, is um, it's fantastic. 
there, that is, I, in my view, sorry, Joe, that's the strongest part of the company followed <laughs> up by the CEO. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the clinical specialists are spectacular. Very good. Well, we don't have any other open questions unless anyone has anything. If there's anything you'd like to add at the end, Dr. Wilden? Oh, yes. So <laughs> um, for any surgeons on, um, I am working to further shorten the procedure. And I have an idea that I'd like to do a pneumatic drill down the center of the frame. Um, I have identified an MRI compatible hose and pedal. Um, for Stryker to create an MRI compatible handpiece, I think we would need to have a certain amount of interest. So, you know, if you are interested or would be interested in having a pneumatic drill that would go down the center of the frame, uh, please get with me via my email, um, just wildenmd at gmail, uh, or tell your clinical specialist. But I think the more doctors nationally we could have on board, I do think that some of the drill companies might potentially be interested in providing us that equipment. So please um, get with me if that would be something you would like to see. Very good. All right. Thanks thank so, much. so much. Thank you, Dr. Wilden, for our very first uh, ClearPoint TV webinar. Yeah. And, uh, we'll Inaugural TV for ClearPoint. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think it went pretty good. Thank All you, right. everyone, for joining. Appreciate no your problem. Time. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Bye-bye.